In the aftermath of a shocking crime, people always ask why. Who would do something like that? Was it about power, money, revenge? Was it done on an impulse or was it planned? What makes these horrific criminals tick? In Wondery's podcast, Killer Psyche, retired FBI criminal profiler Candace DeLong dissects the thoughts and behaviors of the most infamous felons in history. With a career spanning nearly five decades, she sat across the table from hundreds of criminals and spent countless hours inside their minds. And you'll definitely want to listen to the episode of Killer Psyche where Candace looks into the shocking case of Mary Beth Rowe Tinning. In 1987, Tinning was arrested and convicted for the murder of her ninth child, Tammy Lynn. A staggering eight of Tinning's children had died before this one, but their deaths had been deemed genetic tragedies. What would cause a mother to commit such unthinkable crimes? And would Tinning's diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy get her out of jail? One of the highlights of the show for me personally was just how knowledgeable Candace is regarding all of the peripheral details to a case. It was fascinating to gain insights into the aspects that, well, generally speaking, are either overlooked or not considered in much detail when viewing what is available to the general public. Candace has a lot of expertise in her field, and the reflections she provides are really intriguing. So, listen to Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Back in 2015, I was dog-sitting for a family that my parents knew really well. They lived in a wealthier neighborhood and had three dogs. It was a very safe area too, so my parents were okay with me doing it, even though I was still in high school. They had contractors working on their deck outside, and I was notified of this by the homeowners, and they told me that the guys would never have a reason to come inside the house, so I shouldn't have any concerns about interacting with them. So, one evening I returned to the house after school and cheer practice. I walked through the threshold and down the hallway into the kitchen in the back of the house to let the dogs outside and there was literally a man just standing there staring at me. None of the lights were on, I almost had a heart attack in fact. I flipped the light switch on and it looked like it was one of the contractors. He was smiling too like a, a complete psychopath. He held up the spare key from outside and said... You're staying here all alone, right? You should have hidden this key better. The key was hidden in the front of the house under a rock. And not only that, but it was a very hidden rock. In the back of the garden, hidden under a bush. And the contractors, they were working in the back of the house. There was absolutely no reason for them to have found that key. Which tells me that this guy had been purposely looking for it. I told him to leave immediately or I would call the cops. As he walked by me to get out of there, he whispered to me, the cops wouldn't do much. It wasn't breaking and entering. Then he handed me back the spare key. I immediately called the homeowners and they were obviously freaked out on my behalf. They called the contracting company to fire them and wanted to know the name of the exact guy who was entering their home. And it turns out that this dude wasn't even actually a part of the contracting company. The whole team that was at the house every day was at that moment with their boss at dinner. Which means that some random dude was watching the house, found out that I was there alone, pretended to be one of the contractors, and broke in just to mess with me. Thank God that my father came and spent the night with me. And thank God that this creep didn't do anything worse. To this day, we still have no idea who he was or how he found that key. I'm fairly confident too that he didn't try anything because once I came through that door, the owner's largest dog, a Labradoodle, came downstairs. The creep obviously didn't know this, but that dog was extremely timid and shy. The reason that he didn't come down when the guy entered was because he was probably hiding and felt comfortable to come down once he heard my voice. I think that the presence of that big dog 
may have scared him that day. And I think that I may have just gotten really, really lucky. This is a, a story as told by my dad. My dad was a younger teenager at the time and was riding on the bus in Chicago. A man got on and sat in the seat across the aisles from him. He turned toward him and started to strike up some conversation. My dad says that the hairs on the back of his neck raised and he got a seriously creepy vibe from this guy. Gacy was all smiles and charm and asking my dad increasingly personal questions. Luckily, before things got too personal or creepy, my dad's stop came up and he enthusiastically noped off the bus and pretty much forgot about it at that point. It wasn't until years later, 1978, the year that I was born, that he saw on the news that same creepy guy, affectionately known by children as Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. Apparently, he had a thing for teenage boys. But here's another creepy detail. My dad is best friends with a guy who happened to live across the street from Gacy as a child teenager. He confirms that Gacy was a really creepy dude. He also confirmed that his parents observed the police and forensics go to work on Gacy's basement and painstakingly remove 26 teenage boys from the crawl space. Sweet home Chicago. Am I right? So I'm going to tell you guys a story that happened when I was 17. This story, it still freaks me out so much and I don't even know what happened that day. I would like to have your opinion on it if that's alright. It was in November and my friend Jacob was going to have his 17th birthday. Me being a good friend, I proposed to have him sleep at my house and then go for a walk the next day with friends in the forest. He accepts, everything goes well. He sleeps at my place and the next day we leave with friends for two hours off the road. The forest is a bit far but at the time I lived in the city centre so it took a little while. But after the road I quickly realised that I forgot the keys to my house at home and that therefore the door to my house was not locked. But hey I tell myself, we are in town and only a few people frequent the suburbs anyway, it should be fine. The day is going well and it's time to go home and I was stressed out about knowing if my house had been robbed or not. But in the end I just said to myself that there was basically no chance of that happening. My friend Jacob wanted to spend more time with me before I left for my studies and so we did that. And in the end he decided that he was going to sleep over my place. We walk into my house and I see that it's all intact. It's pretty nice looking and wide open so I walk around the house and... That was when I noticed something. The cellar door, which I never open, was open. And there was white paper on the floor. I quickly realized that we had to call the police and check if there was anybody in this house to reassure us that there wasn't. Myself and Jacob, perhaps stupidly as well, decided to shout out that if the stranger didn't come out that the police would take care of it. To be honest, I was paralyzed with fear and... I was scared that the stranger was actually going to come out. And the bad news was that we suddenly heard the stranger, who was in that cellar, cry out, You're not allowed in this home. Get out of here before I lock you up. Jacob immediately got scared and asked me to come and see if the police were outside. Luckily, the police were there, and so they came inside. There was a bit of a scuffle at some point and they took this guy in the car and took him away. But the creepiest thing is that the police actually found kitchen knives, an axe, iron chains, and a board, and there was also a white sheet on which was written behind you, down in that cellar. Obviously, I didn't know this at the time, but I spoke to the police later, and they told me that the individual had apparently run away from an asylum not too far away. Today, I'm 25, and these days, I always check to see whether or not I have the house keys on me or not. So 
So, a little bit of background about me and my roommate in this story. We were both practicing Christians, so I do believe in the spiritual side, demons and such. But I had never had any encounters that I deemed supernatural per se. But that all changed for me about three years ago. We were living in a small apartment at the time where me and my roommate, his name was Joe, lived at the time. His girlfriend had just gotten back from a mission trip to Haiti and brought home a gift for him. This gift was a crudely sort of wooden carved elephant that she was gifted from a Haitian child. This thing was really sort of creepy I guess. It just gave off a really eerie vibe by looking at it. Clearly hand carved with not the best craftsmanship, it was unsettling to look at. However, Joe being a good boyfriend graciously accepted the gift. I somewhat jokingly, but also seriously, expressed how I did not like the mojo surrounding this thing. He basically explained that he thought that it was weird, but it was a gift so he was going to keep it. And at that, keep it in our room. Later that night, I received an unusual text from my neighbor who lived across the hall. We were friends, but we never really texted, so this struck me as odd when she asked, Are you okay? I was in the living room watching a movie at the time, so I replied, Yeah, just relaxing, watching TV. I was met with the response of, Oh, I had just pulled in and thought that I saw you in your room pacing back and forth. My heart dropped instantly. I was home alone at that time, and so I immediately ran into the room to find nothing but stillness. I made a glance at the wood-carved monstrosity, which almost felt as if it was staring back and then closed the door. Now unsettled, but not completely startled, I tried to settle back in. A couple of hours later, it was time for bed, but this time my roommate had already returned. I told him about the text, but he mainly brushed it off. I've never been a great sleeper at the best of times too, so this experience didn't help me to get into a state of rest. However, eventually, my mind drifted asleep, but this sleep did not last long. Now, what I remember is that a feeling that I had never felt before came over me. My eyes felt as if they were glued open and I didn't even notice myself blinking. My body was all of a sudden strapped to the bed, not able to move even an appendage. All I had control over were my eyes and... I immediately looked to my roommate across the room who is dead asleep with all my might trying to let out anything from my mouth but I couldn't even get out a whimper. My eyes then looked to the front of my bed to see a sight that gripped me with absolute curling fear. An imposing outline of nothing but blackness. So black that it stood out amongst the rest of the darkness. There was no face, no true shape, just the vague structure of a humanoid creature that looked as if it was a void absorbing darkness and growing even blacker by the second. I moved my eyes up to try and avoid this thing, but it was so tall it was hard not to see it. Then, it felt as if my chest was being crushed. Looking down at the pressure of my chest, it now appeared that the thing was coming over me. It wasn't crawling over my bed, but actually levitating closer and closer to me until I was forced to stare at nothing but the void before me. What I presumed to be this creature's face, I guess. There was no emotion, no noise, no nothing, just complete darkness. And when I think back to this, that's what churns my stomach the most. The lack of anything is something I, I'd never experienced before. I don't remember the thing leaving or me falling asleep. I just all of a sudden woke up in the morning naturally thinking that my mind had just dreamt up a terrible nightmare and I was still pretty shaken. However, when I looked to the floor of the room and saw that wood-carved creature had fallen off its shelf and rolled a solid three feet to the foot of my bed, I felt ill from the fear. I immediately decided in my own mind that the events must be connected. I have never suffered from sleep paralysis before or after this event. We got rid of the wooden elephant and then blessed each of the rooms of the house and after that we had no issues until we moved out. I truly believe as well that this wood carved object had something attached to it or at least something to do with what happened. I'm not very informed on the subject but it was of a Haitian descent so my first thought was maybe voodoo or something. 
This is my only ever encounter of this type of thing, so please do let me know if you have any information or opinions and similar stories. Thanks for listening to my story. It's uh, good to get it off my chest. When I turned nine, my parents finally let me start walking to school. It wasn't far, and even though they were worried, I assured them that I would be fine. I was so excited because my best friend lived next door, and that meant that we could walk to school and back together pretty much every day. Things were going great as well the first few weeks. We had so much fun laughing and talking all the way to school and back home. There was a liquor store along the way that we would stop at on the way home too to get some snacks and candies, but only on a Friday. It was like our little treat and the thing that we looked forward to at the end of the week. One Friday afternoon after school, we began our walk to the liquor store, talking about school as usual. It was just like any other time that we went to the store. We would rush in laughing all the way to the candy, pick our favorites, and hop in line to pay. This time though, there was a man with a pack of beer and... He looked like he worked in construction or something. He was in the line before us with another man, but when he saw us, he let us go first. We thought that he was just being nice, so we happily obliged, and as I talked to the cashier, my friend stayed behind me, and I could hear the two men behind us speaking in Spanish, I think, and laughing, so I turned around to look and see my friend with a really nervous look on her face. She grabbed my arm hard after I paid and practically pulled me out of the store. I kept asking her what was wrong and she said that she didn't feel safe and we should just run home. I was confused and I wanted us to enjoy our candy on the way back like we always did until she told me what she'd heard. I don't speak Spanish but she did and apparently the two men were talking about me. She said that one of them pointed to me and said she looks like the one. They both laughed and agreed and the one with the beer said, let's follow them and we can grab her around the corner. She's small and won't put up a fight. I froze in fear. We were still in the parking lot of the store and didn't know what to do. We looked around us and saw the two men get into a big work truck. They didn't even glance our way so I told my friend that they were probably just joking and we were being paranoid for being scared. But... Boy, was I wrong. My friend didn't agree with me and said that they were definitely serious and we should start running. I was hesitant at first until I turned around and the truck was right behind us. I took one look at my friend and we grabbed hands and ran as fast as we could. Our hearts were racing and we didn't dare turn around. We were both crying and I ended up dropping our bag of candy We turned around the corner and there was the truck again, and my heart dropped. The man in the passenger seat actually hopped out as well and began to approach us. He didn't say a word. His eyes were locked on me. I've never been that terrified in my life. I was frozen in fear. My friend, however, started yelling at the man in Spanish and he seemed to get angry. There was a busy road to the left of us and it was our only way out. We knew what we had to do without even having to say it. We didn't look left or right, we just ran for our lives across the traffic. A car almost ended up hitting us as well, but they slammed on their brakes at the last second and started honking. We just kept running until we were about a block from our houses. We were out of breath and hysterical, we thought that we had made it, but when we heard a whistle and we look and it's that same truck again, the men were on the other side of the street, windows down, whistling at us. We had no option but to run as fast as we could to our house. My mum was in the front gardening and she was shocked to see us running and screaming like that. We couldn't get the words out right but all we managed to say was that a truck was following us. She immediately ran to the street to see the truck peel away. As soon as she calmed us down she called the cops to take a report but nothing never came of it and I was never allowed to walk to school ever again. Back in my single days, uh, I often tried online dating apps. I talked with lots of guys, but this one guy in particular, his name was Tom, we started chatting after we matched up and it went well. So we progressed to talking over the phone. 
He had a nice voice and I liked that he could carry a conversation because I always feel sort of awkward with talking to people and I have the problem of running out of things to say really. My mind will draw pretty much a complete blank when I'm nervous as well. So having him talking to me on the other end of the phone was a nice relief. After some successful phone conversations, we went on a couple of dates in person too that were surprisingly very pleasant. We met up in public venues, a couple of restaurants. We both had a background in English and he was also a writer like me, so it was nice to have these interests in common. Our conversations were easy, in depth, with a pretty nice flow. I invited him to a function in my community where he introduced himself to my neighbors, friends, and even my family. They kind of looked at me questioningly like, is this your new boyfriend? Raising their eyebrows. I told them no, that we were just friends who were still getting to know each other. It felt too, I don't know, soon for me to call him my boyfriend, I guess. But Tom said something different, telling everyone that I was, in fact, his girlfriend. I had to keep correcting him and I felt a, a little bit embarrassed if I'm being honest and I regretted bringing him to the gathering in the first place. Overall, we really only uh, dated, I guess you could call it, I use the term loosely though, for about three weeks before things started to get, well, really weird. You see, Tom was increasing his number of text messages and wanting to spend a lot more time with me, asking to see me almost every single day in fact. At first, I, I thought that this was flattering. I enjoyed the attention and the feeling of being wanted. But at some point, I'm not exactly sure when as well, it just escalated to a, a really different, uncomfortable level. I remember just feeling smothered. He'd blow up on my phone asking me what I was doing, but it didn't seem like he was asking in a normal how are you kind of way. There was a, a controlling undertone to the question, when I answered, he'd want to know every detail about where I was, what I was doing, what time I was doing it. I considered that maybe he was just feeling insecure and that he would calm down with some time. On our next outing, I actually met up with him and my friend so we could go out to a bar and just hang out. At some point though, my friend wanted to leave because she wasn't feeling good. We said goodbye to Tom and I left the bar to take her home. When I checked my phone after arriving home late that same night, I saw that I had a bunch of angry text messages from Tom about why didn't you kiss me goodbye and things like, you don't really like me, do you? I wrote back saying, I just had to take my friend home, I didn't know I was supposed to kiss you. Kissing me shouldn't be an obligation, he wrote. Sorry, I just didn't know about it because I was occupied. We can let this go, right? I'm tired and I want to go to bed now. He said, okay, you're right, I'm sorry, please don't ghost me, okay? Or something along those lines. I didn't know why, but I just felt really weird and that he was just too clingy. And it worsened from here. But moving forward, whenever I talked to him, it seemed like he would be deliberately trying to initiate an argument or a fight. I am definitely not the confrontational type and so this was incredibly energy draining for me to keep up with. But why does everything have to be an argument? I confronted him one day. He explained how he grew up in an abusive household and he was used to the members of his family fighting and arguing all the time. This apparently felt normal to him. I explained, well I'm not used to this and frankly it feels a, a little scary to me. People in my family talk things out calmly when we have disagreements. We don't raise our voices, jump to accusations, or have temper tantrums. You're right, he said. But of course, this didn't change. I lost the spark at this point too. That initial attraction I had for Tom was just gone. Truthfully, I actually felt pretty repelled by him now. I decided that I just couldn't see him anymore. I felt really sad and guilty for his life situation and the way that he grew up, but at the same time, the roller coaster dynamic of our communication was really starting to take a toll on my own mental health. And unfortunately, when I broke up with him, he threatened to end it all. I didn't know what to do, so I asked my parents and some of my old psychology course classmates for advice. 
and everyone advised me that Tom's mental instability wasn't my responsibility and that he needed to go and seek help. He kept flooding me with messages on all of my accounts though. As mentioned before, he was a writer so he'd send beautifully written lengthy pleas for forgiveness and I replied with, I really just need a break right now, but he ignored my wishes and would keep trying and at one point he even sent a photo of his dog telling me his dog says, hi I miss you and that's when I thought, okay, this is weird and manipulative so I'm going to block him and I did. I blocked him on everything, phone numbers, social media accounts, everything. But when he couldn't reach me, he even resorted to some drastic measures. He even emailed my parents. Yeah, my parents. Why is he messaging us, my parents asked me. This feels weird and creepy. I don't know, I said honestly. He's pleading us to convince you to get back with him. I don't want to be involved with this, my mom said. I don't want you to be involved either, I said. My parents knew the whole ordeal already because I had asked for their advice when he had threatened to end it all. So while having a discussion about it, our consensus was to offer no response. They proceeded to block him as well and next it was my friend who had gone with us to the bar. Uh, Tom is messaging me saying that you broke his heart or something, she informed me. What happened? Did you do something to him? I broke up with him, just don't respond. Block him, I said, and she obliged. But unfortunately, even that wasn't the end of it. Then Tom reached out to my neighbors. I guess he remembered their names or something at the community function and memorized them all by heart or something. He reached out to one of them with a lengthy, elaborate story about how we had been together for at least six months and that we were passionately and madly in love. In this story, he portrayed himself as some kind of a victim, like... I was the villainess, a man-eater or something weird. I don't know because I didn't read it. What did you do to this poor guy? I kept being asked over and over again by different neighbors. I was forced to keep repeating an explanation about what had happened. We only went out for a few weeks, I said, a month at most. I advised them to please not respond or encourage him. Honestly, I'm a very private person, so having my whole community know about my situation was deeply humiliating for me. This went on too for about a year. I'd have someone tell me Tom tried to reach out to me again. There was even one older lady, a neighbor of mine, that actually continued talking to Tom over email, even though I asked her to stop. She said, but he writes so beautifully and he's a beautiful dark soul. The whole thing put a rift between her and her husband, so that was a thing as well. A separate neighbor told me that she was afraid for my personal safety because she said he seems like a stalker type, like from those crime shows, which obviously didn't do much to help my anxiety. I spent a lot of time indoors for a while after that too. I felt withdrawn, insecure, deeply embarrassed, and most of all, I felt scared. I felt like I had to look over my shoulder whenever I stepped outside of my home. I took a long break from dating apps, feeling a bit shaken from the whole experience after that. Two years later, in 2018, he texted me from a different phone number saying, You know who this is? If you still don't want me back, don't respond and I'll leave you alone forever. Even though he didn't give me his name, I just knew that it was Tom. Frankly though, I was relieved. My first inclination was to think, I'm finally free. And thankfully, he hasn't messaged me, my friends, parents or neighbors again since that time. And boy, do I just hope that it stays that way. I currently work at a restaurant somewhere in the Midwest. Obviously I can't say what restaurant but it's on a pretty busy road with lots of cars and lots of people walking on the road to get to the bus stop or whatever the destination may be. It's got its own parking lot where I usually will park closer to the doors but the story I'm about to tell is the one time that I didn't. That night I sincerely regret my actions. So to give some backstory... 
A couple of years ago, I just so happened to work at the sports bar and grill directly across the parking lot from my current job. I worked there for just four months, and I have plenty of interesting stories about that place, but that's for another time. Anyways, while I worked at my previous job, I didn't have a car, so I either walked to and from work, or I got a ride. Now mind you, I would walk home at around ten some nights, on a barely lit road when cars weren't always around. This naturally made me feel wary, and this was on the top of the fact that older men would constantly hit on me as a minor and make me feel watched. And this backstory of my old job might not seem that important at the moment, and I didn't think it would ever become relevant again, but it matters in the end, I promise. While working at my old job, I was a minor, as previously stated, but that never stopped drunken men from approaching me and being inappropriate. There was one man in particular who I never forgot about, and who came back to haunt me in just the worst way. The man was taller, quite good looking, and always wore expensive looking clothing and accessories. He had a very elegant vibe to him, which is why I didn't think much of him when he would talk to me while I was working. He started out very polite, in fact. He'd ask about how work was going, how my day was, stuff like that. But as the weeks went on, he would ask more and more personal questions, which started making me suspicious of him. But the event that occurred right before I quit was a night that I wish that I could forget when thinking back on my days at that sports bar. I remember it being a, a long night, probably because it was a sports season and our restaurant would get very busy around that time. And as a hostess, it was really stressful trying to take calls when there was shouting because the hockey team was a golden cup or whatnot. That night, after I had finished cleaning the bathrooms, I remember him being at the hostess stand waiting for me. I approached him and tried to make polite conversation, but I could tell immediately that he was acting strange. His gaze was shifty and he didn't look as put together as he normally did. The first thing that he said to me was something along the lines of, you're only 16, right? To which I confirmed, and he continued with something like, well, when you're 18, I'll have something for you. It'll be a surprise. Just wait till you're 18. And he promptly left the bar section of the grill. I stood there shocked for a moment before composing myself and finishing my cleaning so I could just get the heck out of it. After I finished counting my drawdown, I went out back and unlocked the bike that I'd gotten a month or so after I'd started working there and began to ride home. Note that I was paranoid as heck as I was doing this because seriously, who says something like that to an underage girl? I watched my back all night as I rode home and felt watched the entire time. It was kind of my fault that he knew my age. I had told him a long time ago as I mentioned something about birthday plans, I think but his comment on my age just made me feel sick to my stomach regardless. Now, let's jump to more recently when I started my new job just across the parking lot. It's been years since I've worked there and I had just about let go of the memories of working in that terrible place, but something happened recently that made the memories just feel like yesterday. You see, the stimulus checks and nice weather have brought a surge of customers to my current restaurant I've worked here for almost a year now, and we've been busier in the past month than we have since I even first started. This means that occasionally, I don't get to park right by the doors, and I must park a bit further away. On this particular day, that still makes me feel nervous thinking about, I had to park basically at the farthest corner of a sort of lot due to a large amount of staff and customers taking the closest spots. That day, I thought nothing of it as I went in for my closing shift and worked a long and stressful shift until about 10pm. I work at the front of the restaurant and our closing duties can be pretty grueling, so that night was especially bad because I was the only one up front beside the manager who has to go back and forth between the kitchen and the front to help. So I finished all of my cleaning, albeit a bit later than usual, and felt bad for taking so long but they weren't too upset because a co-worker of mine was waiting on a ride, so they had to wait anyways. So with that, I say my goodbyes to the two of them and head out the back doors to my car. 
I immediately was irritated that I had to walk so far to get to my car and I started digging for my keys. And somewhere in all of that, I didn't realize that there was a third car in our parking lot until it was almost too late in fact. I finally grabbed my keys after a moment of struggling to find them and realized that the third car is in fact not my manager and it was also parked right next to mine. Although it did look similar which is why I didn't think much of it at first, being exhausted from work and all. Upon getting closer, I realized that there's a person inside. So I remember thinking, is my co-worker's ride here or something? But no one came out to go home, so I assumed not. I looked back closer to the restaurant and realized that the front of the building, where I couldn't see before as I left out the back, my manager's car was sitting empty right up front. All of these thoughts were beginning to piece together as I slowly trailed to my car and after connecting the dots I tried to see who was in the car waiting for me. I remember squinting at them. I didn't have my glasses on and that's probably what made them realize that I'd actually noticed them and with that they turned on their car. Immediately I looked away because the car lights were way too bright and when I tried to look back again the cabin light was turned on and I stopped dead in my tracks as if paralyzed. Even sharing this makes me feel terrible but the expression that this man was wearing invoked so much fear that I think my heart quite literally skipped a beat. The man's features were a bit blurry with the distance and darkness but I could tell that he knew me from somewhere with that little overhead light illuminating his face. But truly, it was the lack of facial expression is what really made me scared. Because I figured that he would smile, frown, wave, or something. Anything. But instead, he sat there, arms at his sides, as he waited for me to edge closer. Now, as a young woman, I should know better than to ignore my instincts telling me to get out of that situation, but... For a split second, I almost felt compelled to continue towards my car. I can't explain why, but I distinctly recall taking one step forwards before pausing, asking myself, what am I doing? And then hightailing it back to the back door. I felt like I was prey about to be eaten, the way that I sensed this overwhelming presence behind me. The whole time I debated going back and then running to safety, and he just sat right in his seat and didn't even seem to move an inch. Or so I assume, as I didn't look back too much until I actually reached the door. I did glance back at his car for a split second before dashing inside, and all I remember seeing was his cabin light had turned off, and I could only see a dark figure now, the menacing light no longer illuminating his face. I didn't need to see his face, though, to know that he was still staring, and I could just feel his beady eyes staring right at me. Well, after scaring the heck out of my co-workers by yanking open the back door as I did, I explained what happened. They both got immediately serious and told me to wait with them while they waited for my other co-workers' ride. But we sat for a few minutes and they talked about how freaky the situation was and how they would call the cops if he was still there when we went outside together. But I just sat in silence. I was silent because in the few minutes after the encounter with this strange person, I knew that I recognized him from somewhere. In fact, I knew that he was that same guy who had told me to wait for him when I turned 18. It took me a while because he didn't look like he used to. He looked much more bedraggled, a bit older and much, much scarier. I don't know if he saw me that day as I brought out the trash or maybe when I walked into work or something, but he knew that I was there somehow, and that thought terrified me. When their ride finally arrived, we all walked out together and my eyes instantly shot to the area where I knew his car was parked. It was just my car though now, waiting for me to climb inside and get home ASAP. The manager saw my co-worker off into their parents' car and walked me to mine. She helped me to check under my car and inside as apparently she had dealt with a stalker before and knew all of the tricks to stay safe and I thanked her profusely, got in, locking my doors right away. 
I watched her as she walked to her car and started to leave the lot. I looked frantically to see if I could spot his car anywhere in the shopping area that connected with our parking lots, but in the end I found nothing. I live close by my work, so I took a long way home that night, fearing that he was waiting for me to go home and do something sinister. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night, as I kept thinking that he was in the darkest corner of my room with that hollow expression on his face. I considered making a police report, but seeing as the police tend to be pretty useless in scenarios like this, and I literally only had a first name, which also could have been fake, I decided against it. In the weeks since then, I haven't seen him or heard from him. I still think about him every time that I leave the building, half expecting him to be either standing outside ready to snatch me or parked right next to my car. I always leave with my co-workers now though as my parents insisted that I begin doing that after I told them about what happened. But to this day I still wonder why he remembered that I was 18, almost 19 now, but he didn't know exactly when my birthday was, surely not. Although he did show up around when I was 18, but I had almost completely forgotten about I hope that I never do find out what surprise he had waiting for me, that's for sure. And all in all, I most definitely think that I've earned the right to say that I never want to see this guy ever again. So I was on a job where I had to drive side to site and do small upgrades to the shelving at every CVS pharmacy in California. I'm about a month into the contract and I've got over a hundred mile drive through the redwoods to my next location. As I'm driving I notice that I have a smell, a slight funk on myself. If I can smell it too, it will be a hundred times worse to the client. Which means that I'll need to figure out how to get to a shower and change clothes before arriving at the next location. I'm about 40 miles deep on this isolated stretch of highway through the redwoods when I see a sign for a camp at the next exit. I take the turn off to see if they have a shower. I pull into this really small camp that was about 15 spots all tied together in a circle. It's an awful camp, but it's deserted and they have a shower. Perfect. I grab a towel and a change of clothes and I head to the bath building. As I approach, I can hear water running and I get to the building and there's someone in one of the stalls taking a shower. This is really weird. I mean, the camp is deserted, no cars, no tents. It's the middle of winter and we're miles and miles from civilization. So who in the world could be in there? It's got to be a pot farmer, right? Maybe a homeless dude? Are there meth labs in the redwoods? I'm not quite spooked by it, but my instincts are telling me that this is very weird. I decide to go ahead and use one of the showers a few stalls down from him. I'm confident that the door's a thick metal with a big strong bolt lock. The shower runs on quarters. Nice California. I take off my clothes and I slide some quarters into the slot and the water immediately turns on. A second later, I hear whoever this person is just yell out weird sounds and profanities. And... I must have stolen his hot water or something. I feel awful, but I can't shut it off now. The water instantly runs when the quarters go in. Nothing I can do, so uneasily I step under the water, wondering what's going through the other guy's head. I don't have to wait long to find out, though. I'm about maybe a minute into my shower when there's a huge bang. There's a smash against my metal shower door, followed by him screaming, and then more banging... But this dude is trying to kick down my door at this point. I'm petrified. I get out of the shower and I stand by the door dripping wet, naked, with my fists up in case he gets in. And it's hard to put into words just how uncomfortable I felt about the concept of fighting naked. I kept thinking to myself that I should try to put my pants on real quick, but just couldn't bring myself to do it because if the door gave while my pants were around my ankles, I would get absolutely destroyed. I also thought about the implications of fighting someone miles and miles from the next human being. I mean, what are the stakes, right? I've been in more than a handful of bar fights and even enjoyed boxing with my friends, but there was never any real danger. 
If someone was getting hurt, everyone breaks it up. Is this guy going to stop fighting if he wins? Is this to the death? In my mind. I'm so scared that I'm near panicking now, but I try to control my breathing and give myself the best possible chance at coming out of this. After what felt like an eternity of him trying to get in, even though it was probably only a minute or two, he stops screaming and banging and I call out to him. Hey, man, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'll give you some more quarters, okay? There's no answer. I wait a few more minutes and finally relax a little. He must have got his wits about him. I resume my shower thinking about how weird this is and wondering if he'll be waiting for me. But then, I, I remembered my truck. I've got a few grand worth of tools in there. I literally can't afford to lose them. And I'm sure that he's in it now. So, soaking wet, I jump out of the shower, throw on my pants, slam open my stall door and go running out towards my vehicle. As I turn the corner of the building towards the parking area at full sprint, man, am I so relieved to see that he's nowhere around. Which means that he must have slinked back to wherever he hides out there in the wilderness. So this happened back in 2019. Around November 2nd, I believe. Also, this, I can assure you, is true. Though, not sure if this was just a coincidence or what it was. So, back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. Not really to the point where it was too bad, but let's just say that I stopped wearing a seatbelt, smoked two times as many cigarettes as I would have normally, and didn't care much about my well-being for the most part. Due to this, and things getting worse mentally, I did a lot of dumb things, supernatural wise. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious and believe in the paranormal, supernatural, 100%. But anyway, I live next to this huge cemetery and drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging for one of the spirits to get me in a car accident. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe, so I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. And lo and behold, November 6th, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every day and was coming up to a red light, when out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of nowhere, I heard a loud honk from behind me and was rear-ended by one of those big white RG&E trucks that fix telephone poles and stuff. Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection, and once again out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random old dude in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked, literally demolished, and I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from that cemetery. There are never, and I mean never, any cars this early in the morning. There may be one every now and then, but even that is rare for the most part. Also, while I was talking to the old man, they lived in a town literally 40 minutes away and were driving to the park. But the whole story is just so weird and it honestly kind of creeps me out, but yeah. I was in an extremely bad financial situation, so I was stuck without a car for quite some time. When I was driving by the cemetery begging to be in an accident, I meant that I sort of well, wanted it to end, so... I think whichever spirit heard me or whatever wanted to mess with me or something, I don't know, take it as you will. Maybe this was an extremely weird coincidence, but if not, always remember to be careful what you wish for. So 
So I'm going to try and report this with as little dramatic flair as possible because it seems like people sometimes get carried away with the storytelling when reporting something like this and I want to avoid that if I can. So this happened a long time ago and not even in America but for the first time the other day I was discussing it and suddenly realized that it actually involves three of the major factors associated with a lot of the missing 411 cases. A body of water, a dog behaving extremely unusually and large amounts of granite. So I was in my mid-teens at the time and due to the unusual circumstances my dad had woken me up in the middle of the night to walk the dog with him and have a chat. It was around two in the morning. It was a full moon and a very bright night with great visibility. The skies were clear and we were walking on a granite hill, an extinct volcano in fact, that has a valley in the middle with a sort of a small lake in it. We had walked around the lake before starting up the side of the valley towards the ridge with the dog on a leash. As we began to approach the top of the slope, the dog stopped dead and point blank refused to come any further in the direction that we were walking. What I mean too is that he was literally a dead weight on the leash and we would have had to have literally bodily dragged him to move him even an inch further forward. We realized that he had tucked his tail between his legs, was visibly shaking and was in a curled crouch making himself as small as possible. He was also entirely fixated on something ahead of us that we hadn't actually noticed or paid attention to beforehand. It appeared to be a straight black line emerging vertically from the ground. I remember thinking at first that it was a plastic tube that used to protect vulnerable saplings from deer because in the first moments we became aware of it, there were no discernible features whatsoever other than a sort of black vertical bar. But as we watched, the straight black bar unfurled into the crude shape of a humanoid, I estimate to have been around 8 feet tall. Unfurled is the best term that I can think of to describe this process. But if you've ever seen a butterfly emerge from a sort of chrysalis, it was something like that. The figure though was entirely jet black, but there were no visible features or contrast within it to any degree, despite the bright moonlight. And black doesn't cover just how dark this thing actually was. It was what I imagine a black hole might look like. And although the figure itself wasn't remotely transparent or unsubstantial, the outline was slightly fuzzy or blurred, almost like something that's vibrating extremely quickly or a washing machine on a high spin cycle or something. Also, it did not have human proportions. It was almost like a child's drawing of a stick man, but with disproportionately long arms and legs. If you're imagining something like a stick insect made out of the material Vanta Black in the rough shape of a person, then you're pretty close to the mark. The head was unusually small though and I remember the top of the head being somewhat flat although my dad doesn't. In every other respect our recollections of the event are identical though which is what tells me that I'm not crazy. This all happened within probably under a minute and then it turned and faced us. I'm not going to give it a melodramatic description and in fact words can't really do it justice but Although it lacked any features whatsoever that might be identified as eyes or a face, you could feel this thing's attention on you. Instantly too, every hair on my body stood erect and I broke out in goosebumps. I turned to my dad and said, Dad, what is that thing? He's one of the most skeptical and level-headed people that I know, so what really freaked me out was that his answer was just, I don't know, but we need to get out of here right now. And as a young man being able to detect genuine fear in my dad's voice, that itself was quite unsettling. We immediately began to walk sideways away from the figure so as to not entirely turn our backs on it. And the minute that we began moving away, it was like a spell was broken on the dog who began literally dragging us. But then the figure followed us for more than five minutes maintaining the same distance at all times. It walked with large, slow, deliberate strides and I remember its arms swung in long arcs as it moved. At no point did it show any sign of aggression, mind you. It just simply followed, maintaining the same distance from us the entire time. 
It was perfectly and completely silent. There wasn't a sound when it was following us, which was really weird. But we were in a highly adrenalized state during this pursuit, and the atmosphere was extremely tense. But we exchanged very few words other than whispers like, is it still following us and don't look at it. It never even crossed our minds to run, which in hindsight seems unusual given that neither of us even entertained the possibility that this was just another person out for a walk. In the moment, we both just had an almost literally overwhelming sense of wrongness about the situation, I think. But after about five minutes, I stopped. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, this is completely insane. What is going on? What is that thing? And when we stopped, it stopped. And again, just turned to stand facing us straight on. Because of the total lack of features though, it may as well have been facing directly away from us, but like I say, there was a definite physical sense of when this thing's awareness was focused on you. We stood in total silence. The dog continued trying to drag us away. It stood motionless for a minute or two and then, as we watched, it turned, sank down into the solid ground and just disappeared. Immediately, it felt like some sort of a charge in the air had dissipated, and we began power walking back to the car. But when we got back, we were still buzzing with adrenaline, obviously, and woke everyone up to tell them what we'd seen. And that's the story. I can't really add anything else that wouldn't just be, well, dramatic flourishes for storytelling purposes. The dog's behavior was extremely uncharacteristic of him, if we had encountered another person under the same circumstances, there's not a doubt in my mind that he would have been barking and straining on his leash to approach them rather than get away like that. That's partly why he was on a lead too, but also because he was a rescue and very prone to chasing animals and disappearing for like 20 minutes or so. Needless to say though, we were both quite shaken as neither of us could really come up with any plausible rationale for what we'd experienced. Occasionally over the years, people have suggested that it was a broken spectre where our own shadows were being cast by the moon on a fog bank or low cloud, but I just cannot accept that explanation. There just wasn't any fog or clouds present, and visibility was excellent due to both clear air and the bright moonlight. And honestly, I have no real theories about what we saw or was my dad. Although I still consider myself to be a naturally skeptical person, this definitely completely shattered my ability to dismiss other people's stories of high strangeness and wild theories. Even those that at face value seem absurd. I can hardly laugh in someone's face when they say that they think Bigfoot is real but comes from another dimension, for example, or that something otherworldly is taking people in the wilderness. Although, obviously, I have no reason to believe this was Bigfoot, and the incident occurred in Scotland of all places. Years after the fact, though, and years ago now, I found a thread on a bushcraft forum where people were discussing spooky experiences in the outdoors. And to my amazement, there was actually a hunter who reported seeing the exact same thing crossing a clearing in the woods from a hunting hide during a, a full moon in America. I don't have a link because this was a long time ago, but they reported identical details. The small head, the long arms that moved in sort of pendulous arcs when it walked, the slow deliberate stride, the total blackness and lack of features, and even the fuzzy outline that they described in exactly the same way, as if it was vibrating. Obviously, you can make of this what you will. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything, and I'm not married to any particular theory about what we saw. I just thought that it was worth sharing here. But before I finish, I want to briefly touch on two of the more obvious explanations for what we experienced and why I struggled to accept them, but first, because it's relevant to one of them, let me mention that there are at least some caves on this hill and that they've been associated with spooky stuff before, although I didn't know this at the time. In 1836, a group of schoolboys found a small entrance to a previously unknown cave on the hill near where this occurred that contained 17 miniature coffins containing what we would describe today as voodoo dolls, 
and some of them are still on display in the Scottish National Museum today. But anyway, now for the rational explanations. So the first one is that we were hallucinating. The problem with this is that the dog's strange behavior was caused by something unrelated, but in the familiar environment, in the dark that we entered, some kind of adrenalized state where our minds project a tangible threat onto an unexpected object, possibly actually one of those tubes used to protect trees I mentioned earlier, and we both hallucinated the same thing? I don't know. I find this hard to accept because of the specific details that we both recalled afterwards. Long arms, small head, vibrating outline, slow deliberate stride, swinging arms, strong sense of when its attention was focused on us, and all of this despite not actually talking about what we were seeing at the time, and also that the dog was very clearly focused on the same thing as we were, and absolutely terrified. But the second is that it was exactly what it appeared to be, a very unusually tall black-skinned individual emaciated to the verge of death that was vibrating. In this scenario, they would have emerged from a hole in the ground, remember the cave, and perhaps were shivering from the cold. It is Scotland after all. They then followed us in silence before descending back underground via another hole. And you know what? I can almost accept this, and that due to the adrenaline our brains interpret it as being more dramatically strange than it actually was. The problem with this theory is that it would still be really, really weird, right? But it does bring us back into the tangible world of things, I suppose, that actually exist, because although Scotland is something like 98% white, there are still thousands of Scottish people with black skin, and it's possible some of them are very tall, I suppose. I guess the only thing that's worth maybe adding to this is that this event seemed to flick some switch in my head that made me no longer remotely afraid of the dark under any circumstances. You'd think that it would have gone the other way, and I'm not laughing as a vampire or some possessed creature of the night or anything, but I worked in a bakery at the time and walked to work along a river in the deep valley in the middle of the night. Sometimes it was pitch black to the extent that you would have to feel your way ahead with your hands, and I'm not ashamed to admit that sometimes get a bit spooked, especially when a fox suddenly screamed right next to you. But after this event, just never again. I can walk through the deepest, darkest forest, abandoned building or mine in complete darkness without feeling even the slightest trepidation since this incident. And I don't really know why, but it's to the extent that people have commented on it. I don't know how you can do that sort of thing. Now, not being afraid of the dark is hardly a superpower, but for me it was always a markedly less intimidating experience after this encounter, and I really can't rationalize why, because it seems like it would make so much more sense for it to have instilled a fear of the dark rather than removed it. Anyway, that's really all I have to say, and in the unlikely event that you've seen the same thing, then please do let me know because I really want to try and figure this out. If anyone has any questions, I'm really happy to answer, but I don't think I've left anything relevant out really, so perhaps this is it. In any case, thanks for listening and here's hoping that this doesn't happen again.